are today uh, for this next hour. We're going to be talking about crowdfunding, how to kickstart your comics project. Uh, Woohoo! Uh, everybody up here, uh, in one form or another, has uh, has run or been part of a significant Kickstarter. Uh, most of them involving comics. Uh, all of them involving uh, comic style art in one way or another. Um, and I'm including myself in that list. Uh, so we're going to just do a real quick rundown of, of, of who did what to who and the what now, and uh, and then we'll move forward. Uh, on my my extreme left here, uh, Mr. Dan Cooney, uh, you did a you did one for a little book called The Tommy Gun Dolls, yes? Hi everyone. Uh, recently completed a Kickstarter graphic novel called The Tommy Gun Dolls, so I'm looking forward to talking to you guys about that. I'm also an instructor here at the academy for the past 11 years. Really, that long? Yeah, all right. Uh, Anar. Anar. Hi there. Hello. Hey there. Uh, you did one uh, that was the Bay Area Comic Anthology, yes? That's right, yeah. We uh, finished the Kickstarter in October, and the book is now available. Uh, will be available here in the, in the Bay Area in various comic shops, uh, and also in Reykjavik, Iceland. It's nice. a very, very niche market. Uh, Nathan, your, your background is, is, uh, is straight up illustration, a little bit of comics, but you were a part of a, 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 a not insignificant Kickstarter yeah, uh, for Toe Jam and Earl. Yeah, big. Yeah, uh, my boss, Greg Johnson, myself, and uh, our lead programmer, uh, Jeff Kreese, uh, we ran uh, the Kickstarter for Toe Jam and Earl back in the groove uh, last April. Uh, we capped out at uh, just a little under... Let me get that for you. Five hundred and eight thousand six hundred and thirty-seven dollars. Yeah, and then we got an additional fifty grand post Kickstarter. Nice. So it was it was pretty big. Well done. Well, I'm along okay. Pretty big. A little bit. Uh, to your right, Mr. Matt Harding, uh, fellow Academy alum, uh, who's Pop Apocalypse. Uh, you've done you've done two now. Uh, two of them, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, sweet. Uh, straight up comics, single straight issues. Straight up comics, single yeah. issues. That and was you, part of Ultrasylvania also. Yes. Uh, we'll get uh, there. We'll get there. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and then to my right, uh, Ms. Ms. Lingerie. Uh And you did Munchies. Yes, I did. Uh, I ran the Munchies campaign myself. And then I also actually worked some on and contributed to uh, Draw with the Pointy End. It's a Game of Thrones art book on Kickstarter. Uh, Chainmail Bikini, which was a comic anthology for like female gamers, and uh, also a recent one called Thousand One Nights. That's a crazy anthology with hundreds of artists contributing to it that raised uh, several hundred thousand dollars. That I'm really excited about. Mad props, uh, Mr. Gregory. Sure, for you is Aaron yeah. or AJ. What do, you, what do you want? AJ is great. AJ Gregory, uh, you took your, uh, your your illustrative skills from the Academy of Art, wherein you were the uh, what, you were the valedictorian for your year, were you not? Yes, I was. Let's shame you publicly. <laughs> uh, applaud for this poor no guy. Shame. Hey, <laughs> super nerd. Uh, uh, you you took your skills and made your own business, Cotton Crustacean. Yeah, I did. I did a Kickstarter in 2012 about my. Second and a half year at the Academy, um, doing scientific illustrations like you see on this gorgeous gal here, and the headless dude, um, and on me, and basically print them up on American-made shirts and sold a bunch of them. Um, that's how we started the company, about $2,000 goal, we made about 12000 bucks, which sounded like an incredible amount back then until I saw Toe Jam and Earl. And now I'm just like, whatever, I shouldn't even be up here. But, um, and then I just did another one that ended a couple months ago. And we had a much higher goal because we were trying to get to WonderCon. So we thought we needed to print like a million t-shirts. So we started at 12,000 bucks and we made 15 and a half. Um, yeah, and WonderCon was cool. So there you go. And then, oh goodness, Jason McNamara. Wow, what does one say? <laughs> Okay. That's past the mic. Yeah, all right. Uh, you um, did a little book called The Rattler with uh, Greg Hinkle? With Greg Hinkle, yeah. So I had managed a few Kickstarters for my wife and her business. Uh, the Rattler was my first Kickstarter. It was my only Kickstarter to date. But um, it greatly repositioned my career 
it launched Greg Hinkle's career. He's now doing books with a guy named Jason Latour, as if he's going anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> but um, it was the best thing I ever did for my career, and I, I'm, I'm glad to uh, share that experience with you and give you my advice and what I've learned from it. But I think it's an amazing opportunity for creative voices to have that platform. I'm very, very grateful that uh, Kickstarter exists. It's an amazing thing, if you do it right. And if you if don't, you do right. I'm going to be livid with you. If you don't, you are screwing over other creators. And I'll name names very shortly. <laughs> uh, and last but not least, uh, Mr. Greg Rucka. You've been, doing, you've been doing comics, as you say, for yourself for about 20 years. Yeah, and, uh, I'm, I'm old now. <laughs> We're the same age. Be quiet. Shh. Uh, Nobody needs to know. And you had your first foray a couple of years ago uh, into Kickstarter. Yeah, I guess it was, what, three years ago or yeah. so on. Um, and yeah, it was successful. Um, and boy, did we learn from some mistakes, but we, we managed to pull it out. Um, and I think we are considering trying to do a second one in the next couple months because we have the content. And now having established the audience, we actually are getting inquiries like are you going to do another one where do we get the second book and that's that's its own that that was a complication i never thought you would get out of kickstarter is that actually once you do it you create an audience for it and um and there is an expectation that you will return so well let's start with you greg i mean why so you you again you had been doing comics for a while you had done lady saber as a web comic why not take it to Image? Why do, why do a Kickstarter? We wanted to do the book a uh, very specific way. We wanted to make the book the book we wanted it to be. That sounds, there was a lot of book there. Um, we, we had a very specific vision for what the volume would be, the way we wanted it to be, the quality of the book. We wanted end papers a certain way. We wanted cloth covers. We wanted a dust jacket. We wanted a page weight. All of these elements that, even though I had been in comics for a really long time, were elements of production that I'd never actually been privy to. And the three of us on the project were all pretty united about this. This was the way to do it. And I had actually been approached by a Dark Horse about doing it. And one of the first things they said was, well, we have designers. And I was like, yeah, except we want to design it ourselves. And when I talked to Oni, they said, well, we have designers. I said, yeah, but we have a design. Uh, and I did not have an in at Image at that time. I was not working with Image. So it never even occurred to me to go to them with it. Hmm. Interestingly enough, now that the Kickstarter on that is completed and we're probably going to do the book too, um, Kickstarter, we may do a new edition of book one that is not the Kickstarter edition, that doesn't have the extras that were in the Kickstarter edition, and make that ideally available through a more mainstream publisher and try to get diamond catalog placement and so on. But if we do that, it is very important to me that it is not identical to the Kickstarter version, because then I think you're, you're shorting that Kickstarter audience. You've, you've made a promise to them, and they came aboard, and they got a thing that should be unique to them. And to then make that widely available I, is kind of a bit, I, I see it as sort of a betrayal of that audience. Sure. Um, and, and, and that audience, that community is the thing that makes Kickstarter work. And, and if you screw over that community, you're dead. Um, you, you need to treat them with respect. You have to engage them. They are your fiercest advocates. They are your righteous critics. And if you don't do well by them, uh, I mean, then you better not show your face again. So. What, was the, what was the hardest part? In, re in retrospect, what was the hardest part for you? Were you, you were running it, yes? Yeah, the campaign? no, we did, we did it all ourselves. What was, the, what was the, if you had to pick one thing that was the hardest part? <laughs> Shipping. <laughs> sure. Uh, we made the mistake, everybody makes this mistake. Well, I, I don't know. I suppose everybody else on the yeah. line will tell me if you made this mistake. We miscalculated our shipping grossly. Apparently, that's what happens the first time you do a Kickstarter. You are always wrong about how much you think it's going to cost to ship. We also, um, we didn't incorporate labor. And that was a big mistake in our estimates. I think we were one of the first Kickstarters that in our campaign, we actually broke down exactly 
how much money we needed for what. Um, we said this much is needed for this and this much is needed for this and so on. And nowhere in there did we have labor. And oh. that was a mistake. Um, and if we do do a second one, I suspect we'll probably go with a fulfillment. Uh, we'll, we'll look into a fulfillment company because our fulfillment took a very long time. I'm not proud of that. It took, I mean, we beat, we, I'm still waiting on some stuff that I pledged on when this campaign was going. But, and, and, and you pointed this out earlier, being able to deliver quickly, we had just complication on complication. The books were delayed coming to us. Some of the books came damaged. My father died. I mean, everything that could have slowed down, fulfillment slowed it down. And it took us, I want to say about a year from completion to full fulfillment. Um, it, was, it was an ordeal. But to be fair, you, you had almost 3,000 backers, yeah? yeah? Yeah. And we had two people sending everything out at best. So, um, like I said, these are mistakes you learn the first time. But there's also interesting, there's no way to know how successful the campaign's going to be. Right. Like we had, we really, really, really thought we'll be lucky if we make our basic goal. Um, and we blew past it in like eight hours. So I think at that point, we, if we'd been smart, we would have been like, we need to sort of calm down and reevaluate. And instead what we did is we were like, oh, okay, well now we have to really make sure we have stretch goals and all this other stuff. And it's like, you know, it would have been wise to have taken a day or two and then said, all right. So. But it was, it was an extraordinary experience. I've never experienced anything like it. It's exhausting. Did yep. anybody else discuss it? Did anyway, it is, it, it, it is, it's a 24 hour a day job for the duration of the campaign. And the, the one thing that I've, I've, I tell anybody that ever wants to, I've, uh, full disclosure, I've done three of these myself. Uh, and the one thing that I discovered after the first time is you have, and, and if anyone else has experienced this, chime in, or if you haven't, I want to know as well, you experience postpartum depression when it is over. Uh, the, the first 30 day campaign we did, um, it ended, we had hit our goal, it was great, we had a party. Day 31, I hit a wall like I've never hit before, and I, I couldn't be motivated to do anything for about three days, because you get addicted to uh, the emails coming in, notifying you that such and such has backed your project for $20, for $40, for $100, and, sorry? Yeah, yes, absolutely. Katie? While there are many, many benefits, it certainly is a lot easier to just like save the money and print some books. Like there's a lot that goes into it that I think that people don't uh, think about. Uh, just like all the extra hours to planning it and the shipping, which is always terrifying. And uh, there's just like a lot of pressure because you promise this to like all these people. Uh, and you really want to like pull through for them. Well, what, uh, uh, you and I had discussed do, you doing a Kickstarter at least a year before you actually did one, and you were adamant that no, no, you didn't want to do that. What ultimately threw the switch for you? What, what, what finally inspired you to say, okay, I'm, I'm going to do it for Munchies? Because uh, I've always done print runs of 100, because that's what I could afford, and uh, I just really, really wanted to do a bigger print run, and there was no way at that time for me to be able to save up uh, that kind of money. And uh, so I decided to suck it up and ask some people for help. And it, it really was, it was an awesome experience uh, and a very difficult one. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna flip to the other side of the table. Einar, uh, you guys uh, did the anthology. Uh, did you all run the campaign collectively? Did you spearhead it? How did that work? Uh, I, uh, I was not directly involved with the Kickstarter, so I'll just leave now. <laughs> no, uh, but uh, uh, one of our members, uh, Sean Marney, he, uh, he sort of uh, oversaw the whole thing. And, uh, but yeah, uh, for my, uh, my input mo mostly was about just uh, promoting it on the, on the internet, on Facebook and, and Twitter and things like that, and hounding my friends and family for money, essentially. <laughs> but, uh, you know, they're good people and they, you know, they support me, so... So it's all good, you know, it's, uh, it, you, you'll be surprised how much, uh, 
you know, uh, people are ready to help you if you just ask them for it. And, and I think it goes without saying that social media is essential oh, yes, for, for, uh, for promoting yeah. Kickstarter. Yeah. There were some uh, members who were shy about uh, joining in on the, the social media thing. We had to kind of like put pressure on them. Like, no, put yourself out there and, and like talk to people, tell them that you're doing this cool thing. And people are going to see that you're doing a cool thing and they, they'll want to be a part of it. And I think it's, a, it's, it's something, uh, a key element that, that some people might not understand about crowdfunding or Kickstarter or doing Indiegogo or any of those is that you don't set up a project, say, I, want, I need $10,000 to do this, press go, and, and, and go, you know, go to the Bahamas for a month and come back and you're going to have all this money. No, it's a, it, is, it is very much a full-time job if you are doing it right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I remember, yeah, Sean and, uh, and, and DB, they were, uh, they, were, they were sort of spearheading the event, so they were kind of stressed out for that whole month. And so you know, I did my part to be in support, be supportive of them. Uh, Dan, how was your experience with uh, Tommy Gun Girls? Uh, my experience, it was a roller coaster ride. It's a lot of highs, there were some lulls in the middle. I think we discussed that the lulls in the middles were without feeling like uh, you're spamming friends and family on social media, just in general, putting the word out there. I think in hindsight, what I learned from the experience, and I was happy that not only we, we met our goal, that there was contingency plans in place for those stretch goals, having learned from doing one I attempted three years prior that didn't work out so well. So went back to the well, researched, learned from others, took my time but it's restraint, um, with especially with social media, because like with Brian was talking about earlier, and Greg, it's, it's a ride, you're excited, it's like, great, you hit your goal, it's like, what do you do for the next two weeks now? And so you feel like you just want to continue to please and excite, but then you don't want to overcommit, and I'm a one-man band, so if I'm adding rewards where I'm gonna offer commissions or cameos in the book, I have to make sure I'm allotting the time set aside for that, in addition to everything else. I have a day job as a teacher, the family to take care of. So those are things I think, it's, it's emotional ride when you're getting those updates and getting the, you know, the backers and you're excited to share that, but also showing that restraint on social media and at the conventions. 30 days prior to my launching, I did a save the date promotional postcard at WonderCon in 2015, getting people excited just to kind of, I think that really made a difference. It was putting the word out before, sending out advanced copies or just partial of the book, just maybe bleeding cooler somebody will pick up, in which a few of them did, and I think that rejuvenated the campaign midway through because someone else was also excited about it, not just myself. And I think that makes a difference too when other people start saying, hey, this is a pretty cool project, let's get behind this and help the guy out. And there's still things that you can improve on, certainly, because it feels like once the book's out, finish it and revisit that. I'm going to start with you, Dan, and I'm going to go all the way down the line and, and ask, uh, uh, when you were preparing for the campaign, what's the one thing you are most grateful that you planned for in advance? Ooh, it comes up. Uh, I think we've had this discussion uh, prior. Um, I think just researching the budget, the time you have to set aside and allow for things in life that are just going to come up that you don't plan for. And it sounds like I'm ending that as a question, like I'm still unsure about it, but uh, you can learn definitely a lot even with the su successes of a campaign and what you can do to improve on that communication. Um, I think that's what you're kind of nudging sure. me yeah, for. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I think it's the research. I think the difference between the first one I attempted just jumping in and I was collaborating with somebody, I was taking a step back, I had some strong advice from a good friend to cut my losses and regroup and start again when I'm more prepared. Research, research the cost, research the time it's gonna take because everyone seems pretty consistent here on the shipping and that's true of what's going to happen. Research how much it's gonna cost to go to Norway versus Australia and the weight of the book, the weight of the rewards. Don't inundate your backer with all this other stuff. Focus on what your strengths are, the book itself, the story. What was the question again? <laughs> uh, if you had to pick one thing, what was the one thing that you were glad that you prepared for before the campaign started? I would say, yeah, to, uh, to Dan's point, um, 
Yeah, it was a. Yes. Okay. Good. Yeah. It, it was a. Yeah. We um, planning the the budget, just figuring out what's uh, what's reasonable to ask of people. I think we actually had a um, uh, a debate about like the um, the, the lowest tier uh, mm -hmm. that you could back people on. Uh, some people uh, thought that you could, you know, we could ask for like a three dollar uh, uh, backing for getting your name in the book, which uh, I, I told them was ridiculous. And um, we, we compromised, I, I suggested one dollar, we compromised with a two dollar bid, and uh, without having the numbers directly in front of me, I think uh, almost nobody went for the, the, the two dollar bid. Huh. Uh, most likely because, you know, if you're, if you're chipping in two dollars, you might as well, you know, go for something bigger. But on the other hand, probably a lot of people who would have put in a dollar uh, just decided to move on. David? Um, so for me, uh, figuring, out, figuring out the budget and figuring out the tiers, uh, I kind of view that as a, a necessary step for Kickstarters now. It's almost second hand, or sec second nature. Um, what really helped us was we lined up uh, like a press blast that would happen on the day of the Kickstarter. We had podcasts, we had interviews, uh, we had uh, gaming websites that were going to cover it the day it launched. And that got us so much coverage. Uh, it, it, we got like a third of our goal uh, within the first 24 hours. And wow. I think it all had to do with uh, trying to line up uh, uh, media coverage of it uh, day of. Um, it, it also helped that uh, we started building up uh, interest in the, the older games. Uh, I don't know, I think it was six months before the launch of the Kickstarter. Uh, the, uh, we started a, uh, a Facebook page. It was just like a fan page. Mm -hmm. um, not for anything in particular, just like to, to get the fans of the old games. Uh, involved in a community again. And then once uh, that community was already built and then they saw the Kickstarter launch, they just spread like wildfire. Nice. So uh, you can, you can uh, plan those strategies before the Kickstarter launches and they'll really uh, work in your favor later. Uh, another thing that really helped, uh, and Greg touched on it a bit, uh, was fulfillment. You never know how many backers you're actually gonna have and if it's more than you estimated, uh, that's more on your plate uh, later on. Uh, and so we got a fulfillment center, uh, or we had a fulfillment center in our back pocket just in case. And we were glad that we did because uh, when we realized how many backers we had after the campaign was over, there was no way we could have fulfilled all that on yeah. our own. We were just three guys. <laughs> With how many, and how many did you ultimately, uh, how many backers? Nine, uh, almost 9,000. Jeez. 9,000? Yeah. <laughs> Matt? Um, so for me, I think having a lot of the artwork done actually was a big, a big help for, for mine uh, because uh, you have so much stuff you're going to have to do once, once the Kickstarter is over that it's kind of, it's, it's good to kind of not have that, getting all of the artwork done uh, beyond your shoulders uh, as well. Um, other than that, I had a, a really, really good Microsoft Excel spreadsheet that I made. It was badass, and uh, that was a huge help. And everything else has basically been covered. I, I, I concur with everything. I'm going to chime in with, my, with, with two things that I always tell uh, my classes or anybody that ever uh, uh, asks me or hires me to actually consult on such things. Uh, I tell them always when, when you're doing like what, what Greg was saying and having uh, uh, on your campaign saying where all the money is going to go, always budget more for shipping costs because it is always going to be more and that is where everyone always fucks up. Uh, and the second thing is that every single reward uh, that, that you give backers for every pledge level, you are compelled to list an estimated delivery date. So say you're running a campaign right now, uh, it's the last day of April, or say it ends today, and the, your delivery date, you, you, you think everything is going to be done and ready to go in June. Make your date July. 
because nine times out of 10, something's gonna happen. Someone's gonna get sick, the, pr the printer is gonna go on the fritz, um, somebody's gonna back out of doing something that they said they were gonna do. And here's the thing, if you say July, and then your backers get their stuff in June, you're Scotty on the Enterprise. You have, you have done the impossible, and, and you've delivered, they're, they're, everybody's elated. It's like, I thought I had to wait another month to read Bob Apocalypse number three, but no, it's here now. Uh, yeah, pardon the drama. Um, Katie. I just wanted to agree with Matt about the art. Um, I think especially for like a first Kickstarter because everything is a lot to learn. It's really difficult. There's a lot of work. Um, well, you should make it as easy for yourself as possible. And having that out of the way really helps. Uh, for Munchies, I had the majority of the book done because uh, I printed it once before, a smaller print run. And uh, because I wanted the Kickstarter to be special, uh, I added eight, an eight-page story. And uh, I found that waiting until after the Kickstarter, like it was a struggle to get that done because I had all the extra Kickstarter stuff to do. But also I had this extra weight of like several hundred people saying they wanted the comic. And uh, usually like I'm only thinking about myself. I'm, I'm pretty selfish when I make comics. <laughs> I, I just draw for myself, and thinking about those other people, like, it just was such an extra time sink. And then, uh, you know, shipping. Uh, I did that right because I just know so many people who went, like, instead of, I mean, they had a successful campaign, but in reality, they went, like, into debt because yep. they didn't uh, do the shipping uh, calculations right. So I was really, really obsessive about it and uh, managed to do all right there. AJ? Um, so for mine, both my Kickstarters, we had a, a, a date on the calendar that the Kickstarter itself was aiming towards, like there was an event. Um, the first one was Christmas. And you don't want to fuck with people's Christmas gifts, <laughs> ever. So pressure was on, and being our first one, we weren't anticipating how much time is taken to get the money from Kickstarter, which takes about 30 days, and then when I can put that order in with the t-shirt printer and how backed up he is, and then how long is it gonna take to get from him and to go from there. Um, so the second time around, we were contacting our t-shirt printer like six months in advance and basically blocking out almost three weeks of his time um, because we were gonna print so many more shirts. We had to print like 1,500 shirts. Um, and the main goal of the second one was to get this large body of inventory so we could pull off WonderCon. And we, we were going to WonderCon thinking we were gonna sell like, you know, a thousand shirts or something like that. It didn't happen like that, but we went down there with 1,700 shirts. Um, and so the, the battle of you know, budgeting that time to get the money from Kickstarter and then to be able to even front some of that money ahead of time, knowing Kickstarter was going to pay us, but it, I don't, to print that many shirts, you're spending about fifteen to $17,000. And so to be able to front some of that out of pocket, the time all that, we did it so much better the second time around that it really, and still it was like down to the wire. I was driving to Oakland, going to the print guy, loading my truck up with boxes and just, you know, super stressed out, getting on the road to go to WonderCon the next day. Like, it was, it was all right down to the wire, but we pulled it off. Um, first time around trying to make Christmas was super stressful. Um, now, that might not apply to comic books so much because um, I think people support comics because they want to support comics. That's not necessarily a gift-driven thing. But for us, because it's like a wearable commodity, that was a, a really big deal. Baby, sweetness. Um, so to answer your question, the most important thing we did was we thought about the experience of backing our campaign. Would you come away with this feeling like it was we respected your time? Could you walk out of this being an advocate for me and my work? Would you come out of this being a fan of the book? Would you want to support other Kickstarters and other independent creators? So to that end, the greatest thing that we did was we finished the book completely on our own time. So yes, there are hiccups when you make a book. This was Greg's first professional book. It took him a while to uh, develop a professional pace. 
So as you're getting out of school and learning this craft, it's going to take you longer to get up to speed than the books you see on the shelf. So I sort of insulated Greg from the criticism of all of that. Um, we were very passionate about the book. We care about how our work is perceived. So you never want the conversation around your work to be, where is it? I gave you this money. You didn't have a plan. So we had a plan. And we took the risk of creating the book completely on our own because we don't have the pedigree to say, oh, these guys will deliver. I'm not Greg Rucka. Um, like, you trust Greg. You don't trust me. I'm not that household name. You shouldn't. Yeah, I don't. But I've been doing independent books for 13 years, and now everyone knows who I am because of this, because I respected everyone's time. So the greatest thing we did was we had a plan to exceed your expectations. And as I said earlier, unfortunately, people's expectations of Kickstarter are very, very low because people do not have a plan. Um, I worked for a software company a few years ago, and I helped them scale their support network. This is very boring. But they needed to scale a very few amount of people to do a very large job, to service a million people. So four people could support a million. So I took that same thinking and like, we had a plan for success. So if we needed 500 books, we would do a US printer. If it went to 10,000, we'd go to a printer in, in Canada. If it went to 100,000, we'd go to China. Like we had a plan for every single thing. And the book was done. It had a barcode. It was ready to go before we launched. If anything went wrong, my wife gets in an email and you would have your book. What also that did, and it plays what someone else over there said, is we created a framework for success. The book went out to reviewers a month before the Kickstarter. Like, you're getting the book. It's done. People are reading reviews of it. You could set up media placements, talk to Bloody Disgusting, get all these people from different audiences to talk for you so I'm not just badgering my family members on Twitter. So the more unique or genre your book is, the more there is a market that is, wants to support your book and your comic book. Uh, we did a horror book. The horror sites were all in. Right? If you just expect news of Rama to blast it out for you, it's not going to happen. You need to go to all these different groups and say, I have something unique for you. I did a book about Mars a few years ago. Martian blogs, sci-fi people love it. They give it more coverage than you'll ever see on comic book resources. So find your people. And you can do that if your book is done. Right? If you have to manage a Kickstarter and do the work at the same time, it's a nightmare. Like your creative hat and your marketing promotion hat are two separate things. Also, like shipping. So Uline, my tip to you is Uline gives you a per unit weight for every shipping material. You know how much a book is going to weigh. Uh, the U.S. Postal Service has a website, has a calculator for shipping all over the world. The shipping prices may raise unannounced, so give yourself a wiggle room of like, you know, 5 to 7 percent. But we did shipping drills per unit. We knew exactly. And my book, The Rattler, is um, one-eighth of an inch shorter than any other graphic novel, so it would fit into a smaller mailer, so it would cost less to ship overseas. <laughs> we looked at this thing backwards and forwards. Um, so that's my advice, is do the book first, especially for your first one. Instead of selling people the idea of a book, tell them it's done, it's, they just want to mail it to you. Um, and it was great, it was the best thing we ever did. Because now the conversation, the book shipped early, like yours, I said August, I knew it was coming in June. I rigged the game. And everyone's like, oh my god, I got my book early. I'm still waiting for something horrible from Dean Tripp. Like year three. Yep. You know, there's, there's been a few of them. And what that does is you're disrespecting your fellow creators if you do not treat Kickstarter with respect. Um, I wouldn't go to Image and screw up my book and screw up their brand because that affects all the other creators. Kickstarter is no different. It's a great publishing platform for voices, any voice. You can find your people there if you treat it with respect. So please, please, please have a plan before you launch. Actually, I'm going to cap onto that too. I, uh, not only, you know, the, the, the campaigns that have yet to fulfill that, that impact the rest of us, regardless of what the material it is, it doesn't have to be a comic. Um, I have backed campaigns that I know were lucrative, lucratively successful. And having had to pay for printing and production myself, then gotten the items in question and was genuinely offended at how cheap they were. I mean, seriously piss it. I've actually lost all, there's a specific campaign and creators I'm thinking of, and I won't speak to them anymore. I feel that they, it was the equivalent of, 
I mean, it was the equivalent of being given tin uh, when, when they promised gold. And I know that they made enough money right. to have made a tidy profit and given me gold. Um, and that's what I mean when I talk about respecting the community. There's an expectation of the quality level. And I, I was sincere, I mean, seriously, like balsa wood rulers. You know, I was like, that was the $10 add-on premium, balsa wood, you know? Okay, guys. Um, you know, for, for our purposes, you learn more by doing it than anything that you can imagine. The smartest thing we did was budget the living hell out of everything. We ran the numbers and 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 ran the numbers. And ran the numbers. We got all our different estimates from different printers and we found the printer that we wanted and we got, we ran everything. We ran in advance what we knew we wanted for the stretch goals. We ran uh, how much they would cost to print. We calculated as best we could the shipping with it and so on. Um, and like I said, we still, we still were off. Um, I will say the other thing that I think was really, really crucial is that we were always engaged and we were always honest. We were incredibly transparent. Uh -huh. And I think that's really crucial. Um, you, can, you can buy a lot of goodwill if you let people know this thing has happened, it went wrong. Whereas, but you tell them immediately, you're honest with the community. Uh, and I, really quickly, I don't know if anybody had this experience. We had two out of like, 3,000 backers. Two backers got books, right? And we had a problem with some of the books. Sometimes they would arrive damaged. And whenever somebody notified us that we were damaged, we'd say, please send us photos of the damage. And as soon as we received the photos, we're going to send you a new book with a shipping label, and you can send us the defective one back. And invariably, people who had defective books would send an email saying, God, I'm really sorry but I got it and I love it, but when I opened it, the block fell out of the case or whatnot. I got two screamingly angry emails about, you're a Kickstarter and you're a horrible human being and my book arrived in horrible condition and, I, and uh, please set, you know, take photos and send them back to us and never heard anything again. Huh. And I, I'm convinced that those two instances out of the 3,000 some odd were frauds. There were people trying to game me. And I'm curious, I'm just curious for the panel, how many people had experienced that? Because I don't have any proof of that. And these were people I contact, tried contacting them over and over and over again when they didn't respond. It was like I, another week. I wrote back to you last week. I'm still waiting to hear back. We want to make this right. Nothing. 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 So. Anybody? We had a few. Yeah? Yeah? Yeah. Was it, was it a simul similar scenario sort of thing? Kind of, yeah. So uh, we, uh, we had a few uh, products that were, getting, uh, that were arriving damaged. Uh, and so we had that backup plan of sending them new ones. Uh, we, we had enough uh, stock. Uh, we, had, we had enough of the product that we could just say, hey, uh, if, if you... Uh, you don't even have to send a picture. Just we'll send you a new one and just tell us. Uh, but they had to go through our. Uh, uh, we got like uh, we got backer kit, which is like a support team. Yeah. Um, and we told them to go. Uh, they would email us, and then we would forward them to backer kit. And that was enough of a middleman to just have the ones that were trying to scam us give up. Because. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it was funny though. They would they would come in kicking and screaming, and then as soon as they smelled that there was there was more uh, more to do than us saying yes, we'll send you a new one. They they we didn't hear from them again. We've got a couple minutes for maybe a couple questions from the gallery. Kickstarter. I don't know if I should say names or not. Yeah. But, all right, the homestead of no. 
Homestuck Kickstarter where they made about like two point seven million dollars. Oh, sorry, what Kickstarter? Uh, yeah, they Kickstarter for this video game webcomic called Homestuck, and they made about two point seven million dollars. And I have, I have like probably dozens of friends who backed this, and all of them are so disappointed with it because of how non-transparent they were and how disappointed they were with just how everything they've received. Uh, I'll say this, uh, making video games is different than making comics. Yeah, video games are completely different, I uh, I'm not mad personally, but I know they're mad personally because of just how long it's been, how much they don't care about it. Right, and uh, I've, I've backed a number of game Kickstarters that have done the same thing. I guess uh, the difference being, um, it's, it's, and uh, I've, I'm glad to say that our studio has been very, very transparent about all that's been going on, um, but uh, it, it's hard to produce uh, a viewable product a lot of the time, and there are, there are unforeseen uh, issues with, with engineering and such that can make it hard to be uh, overly transparent when making a video game. Um, that being said, uh, there's a courtesy of, of letting your backers know what's going on, even if it's just saying we're having so many bugs that we can't show you a playable product right now. Just saying that will, will put them at ease. Uh, and I think that uh, the, the vulnerability of giving, uh, giving money is taken for granted a lot. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I can understand the frustration there. Uh, uh, I'm not sure how to communicate that any differently. I, I think that, uh, ho I mean, hopefully, you, if you run a Kickstarter, everything goes smoothly, but the, it hardly ever happens for anyone. And like just watching so many people go through uh, the whole thing, um, it seems like the fastest thing to make people like turn on you if something happens is to stop talking and to try and hide and uh, not be transparent about it. Because like people turn really fast, but as long as you're talking, you know, I mean, it seems like most people will stick around and stay with you. Yeah, like we, we were like head in, in making the game, uh, well, for a while now, but uh, uh, we hadn't updated since January and we started getting some really nasty, uh, oh, you ran away with our money comments, and it snowballed. Um, and it, to stop that, it was as simple as saying, we're, we're making the game, sorry, we haven't updated in a while, here is our progress. And it, it stopped everything. It's, it's as simple as communicating with people. Yeah. And it, it's n something that, I don't know, I don't know why people don't do it, but, uh, yeah, M more Kickstarter should. Um, yeah, I, I found with mine that within a month I was already getting messages of people just being like, so I'm pretty sure I ordered a shirt, where is it? And it'd be some guy in Holland or something like that. It's like, dude, okay, that's kind of the, um, the litmus test. They're like, oh, I haven't done an update in five weeks. That's why, you know? Or I haven't done an update since we, we got funded. And so immediately do a big update, tell what's going on, and then it stops so it's really quick. So communication is key because people are so impatient. They're so impatient. Now maybe, you know, the video game, some bigger, or like, hey, we're making this movie. Like people are obviously going to be like, oh, I can't wait in two years to see that. Or comic books take a long time. But if you start making something that feels to people, like you just you go to a warehouse factory and they're going to make you this gizmo and then that's it. You know, they're going to want to see that within like weeks. It's, it's pretty crazy. So, heads up. <laughs> have, have you guys ever backed a Kickstarter and then kind of forgotten about it? And then months later, you, uh, you, you get something in the, in the mail and you're just pleasantly surprised? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, um, one of our, uh, our team members, I'm not going to say who, uh, kind of had the idea that that was kind of how most people worked. Uh, we were 
like it had been a while since we'd updated our, our Kickstarter page, and I was telling like we we really should let people know like what's going on because this is this is dragging on a little bit. We landed some we ran into some problems with our production and uh, getting things printed. So I was like, we really should pe tell people that you know things are slowing down and why that is and and like what the new you know date is. One of our members was like, you know, I think. I don't think most people are really going to care. I think they're just going to, they've just forgotten about it. And, you know, I, I thought to myself, well, I really don't care what you think. I, 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 I care that we show people that we care. That, uh, you know, we, we, have to, we have to communicate to people. Even if people say, oh, is that, is that, was that a still a thing? Like, we still have to let them know that it is still a thing. That we really are out there, that they just haven't been screwed out of their money. Absolutely, absolutely. communication is key. And, Courtesy and, and respect. Yeah, because it. Oh. I was just going to say, I never thought that the money was ours until the last book was mm -hmm. received. Mm -hmm. You know, people think that the, they, they see that you raised this much amount of money and they think, okay, that's yours. They, and, and that's why they're like, and you took our money and ran away. And our philosophy was, no, it's not ours. Not a penny of this is ours. Uh, you know, the only money we get is anything that's left over when we're finished with everything. So, well, it, it, they're investors. Like that's, it, you have to view it as such, and it, it's not your company. Uh, like if if you're, if you get an actual investor, uh, it's not yours until you recoup their money. So, just view it like any other regular business would view it. It's as simple as that. And that's our time. Uh, let's hear it for our panelists.